You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. I'm Steve Englehart, and you're listening to the Epic Marvel Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Epic Marvel Podcast. I have an interview today with Steve Englehart, and we're going to be talking about West Coast Avengers. This is an interview that I actually did about a year ago, I think, at this point, and I've been sitting on it for uh, the right time to share it, and that's what I'm going to do this week. I'm going to share it with you. Uh, we go through a whole bunch of stuff about the early days of West Coast Avengers, launching that ongoing series and talking about the characters and the situations and the, the big, huge events that happened there. Uh, it's very, very fascinating. A lot of a peek behind the curtain to find out what actually went on behind the scenes in the Marvel offices back then. Just before we get to it, I do want to say that this episode is brought to you by Dying Breed Collectors. And if you enter the code Epic Marvel Podcast at, at checkout, when you make your purchase, you can get 10% off of any Epic collection that is in your shopping cart. And if you want, for the month of November, you can, uh, get, an, you can get 15% off of a very specific Epic collection. That one would be Spider-Man uh, Epic Collection Volume 6, The Death of Captain Stacy. So, Epic Marvel Podcast, all one word, all lowercase, that's the code. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just look for Epic Marvel Podcast or Epic Marvel Pod, and you'll be able to find us there. I also have a Facebook group where we talk about Epic Collections all day, every day, and you can join us there. Just search for Epic Collections on Facebook. And that's about enough from me, so here is my interview with Steve Englehart. <laughs> West Coast Avengers started as a miniseries by Roger Stern, uh, and then you got to take over for the main series that started a, a little while later. How did that come to being? Was it something that you approached editorial with, or they approached you? They approached me. I had been out of comics at that point. After I did Batman for DC, I, I left comics and went off and, and wrote a novel and then went to work for Atari and was happy working at Atari right up until they sold the company. I mean, I had gone to San Diego uh, that year to see old friends, even though I wasn't in comics. And both Shooter from Marvel and Giordano from DC came up and said, hey, you want to do any comics anymore? And I said, no, no, I'm done with comics. And then I went home, and that Sunday night, my boss at Atari called me up, and he said, I think we're all going to get fired on Wednesday. Oh, no. <laughs> So <laughs> on Monday, I called up both Shooter and Giordano and said, well, actually, you know, maybe. And so that was part of that deal. When I came back to Marvel, they said, we're going to have you do West Coast Avengers and Vision Scarlet Witch. And there might have been another one, I forget. But anyway, yeah, it was like they they gave it to me. And I know Roger was bent out of shape about it. And, you know, he and I have talked about this and it's been it's been talked about for years. I had nothing to do with it. I mean, they, I didn't know anything about that. I knew I knew he'd done the miniseries. I read the miniseries. Right. But yeah. I mean, they said you're doing West Coast Avengers like, OK, fine. You know, and and it was only later that I found out that Roger wasn't thrilled about that as would be expected but yeah for sure that was that was uh shooter or mark grunewald or somebody came up with that uh did you get any oversight as to uh, the direction of the books since they obviously had um stuff in mind for you did they know that where they wanted the direction to go no because in those days the writer was in charge of his books yeah we were still in that era so no they just said here you go and so like the idea of doing the crossover introduction between the two series, West Coast Avengers and Vision Witch and all that. I mean, that was that was something I thought of that I thought would kick it off nicely. And 
this was an era, even with Shooter in charge, uh, Shooter didn't have a problem telling other people what to do, but getting me back in those days was like a big get for Marvel. Mm -hmm. He treated me with kid gloves for a long time. And I, you know, I just to finish that off, I mean, he, he never gave me a hard time while I was there. When he got fired later on, people said, oh, he was gearing up for you. He, he was pissed at you and he was going to do stuff, I, you know, but it never happened. So I don't really know. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So this team of Avengers, this very specific team with Wonder Man and Tigra and Mockingbird and such, um, these, are, these are a few kind of underdeveloped characters at the time. And you did a lot to do, a lot of, uh, you know, character development with them. Uh, mm. Who were your favorite characters to work with, um, and did that show off in the in how much you know quote unquote screen time these characters got? Um, those are two good questions, and and so they have two different answers. One, my favorite was Mockingbird. I always liked Mockingbird a lot, and Hawkeye. You know, right with her. I did find most of the other characters to be underdeveloped, and and did work at them to develop them. I mean, that's something I like to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've said that Hank Pym was never one of my favorite characters. And yet, you know, I did a, I did an arc with him. I do not base screen time on personal preference, really. Okay. I mean, if I'm, if I'm doing, if I'm doing that team, then I want everybody on that team to shine. And it was easier with Hawkeye and Mockingbird than it was with Wonder Man. Wonder Man didn't do much for me either. You know, I mean, if I'd put that team together, I I might have, I would definitely have done differently. But, you know, again, it was handed to me. They said, this is the team, this is the book, write the book. So it's like, okay. And so I tried to do the best I could with Wonder Man and Tigra and, and, and the rest of them that weren't as fully formed as... Hawkeye and Mockingbird just, I mean, she was new too, but she, yeah. you know, she fit right in with him. And so there was a lot of easy, him being Hawkeye, lots of easy stuff to do with her. And then, you know, as the series went on, the characters, I've always said characters tend to write themselves for me. I mean, I'm, I'll say, this seems interesting, let's do this. And then once it's done, then they've established some facet of their character, which informs how they're going to act the next time they're called upon and so on so on. so i mean mockingbird ended up becoming probably the linchpin of of that series for me i mean hawkeye again right with her but but she was the one who was more driving things as things went along but you know i never never at least felt like i was giving wonder man or tigra um you know short shrift no, well, you would devote complete arcs to those characters that, that they those two especially have such convoluted pasts with the cat people and with uh, with Ultron and everything. Right. So, yeah, it was right. great to be able to address those things too. That four part story that you kicked off with, bringing in kind of all of the elements of the the Pym Williams dynamic there, it was so convoluted and great. That kind of thing, like, do you need to dive back into history to make sure you're getting all your facts right and such? Like, how much research do you do and that kind of stuff? I Yeah, I do all that. I mean, I see, I started, it's, I got to put it even in context now. I mean, I started writing comics in 1971, 72, which meant that I was really just 10 years in to the Marvel universe. That's and, true, yeah. And so Hawkeye was Hawkeye. There were no reboots. There were no redos. There were no purple Hawkeyes, green Hawkeyes, blue Hawkeyes. <laughs> right. It, you know, they were just the guys that they had always been. Yeah. And so, and continuity. I loved continuity. So if I was going to take over a series 10 years in, I would go back and I'd read them all in the first place anyway, but I would reread stuff and make notes and find things to, to work with. Because it was, you know, that was not only my preference, but that was Marvel's preference in those days. Uh, you know, as time has gone on, I, I came to understand that, you know, continuity doesn't work after 70 years yeah. or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, you know, now that we're, now that we are where we are, if I were to write stuff today, I wouldn't insist that everybody had to know what happened for the last 70 years. But in those days, yeah, you know, I wanted to get every one of them right, which to me meant... I didn't contradict anything that had happened before or, yeah. you know, I mean, you could always do the story about 
that thing that happened before actually happened like this, you know. But I mean, it was always based on the fact that those things actually did happen. Uh, tell me a little bit about the Vision Witch 12 issue series here. I, I love the format of going month by month, like in real time. Uh, yeah. what, what, what inspired you to write it that way? Well, that was only going to be a 12 issue series. I mean, the West Coast Avengers was ongoing, but it was always determined that Vision Witch was going to be 12 issues. And I used two issues to get them started, which left me with 10. And then I thought, I, Richard Howell was the artist on it. And, um, Carol Kalish was his girlfriend, and she was also the marketing director. I hope I'm, I might have the title wrong at this time, but she was a honcho at Marvel. Um, and the three of us went out to dinner, you know, when we started this to kind of talk about what we might want to do. And I had gotten Vision Witch married uh, in the original Avengers, right? And thought, well, what's the next step for a married couple? And of course, it's kids. And of course, they can't because he's an android. <laughs> yeah. Of course, she's magic, you know. Yeah. So we were just throwing this stuff around, and and I thought, yeah, you know, she can make it happen, and that's what a parenting couple would do. And I have ten issues, and I could make it. I could, you know, I so I could do the nine month thing, and then the idea was, in addition to her getting bigger every month, every month had a holiday in it, so I could tie each story to a holiday. So the whole thing just became this kind of like. What can I structure around a year-long commitment here? So at the end, they had their kids, and pretty soon John Byrne came along and said, "No, that never happened." And, yeah. you know, and they <laughs> they wrote the kids out, which I was, you know, that didn't make me happy. No, but of you course. know, it was it was his book at that point. I find it interesting that the kids are back in WandaVision, apparently, from what I understand. I hope so. Yeah. So. Um, they survived all this, <laughs> <laughs> all this stuff. But yeah, you know, it's just, I was, I, I told you I liked Mockingbird. I can't say I have a predilection for women heroes because, you know, I mean, I, I liked Captain America and Batman and the Silver Surfer and the rest of these guys just fine too. But I really liked Wanda from the start. I mean, that was, I, I always liked the Scarlet Witch. And I always liked Mockingbird right from the start. And so I was happy to, you know, happy to do things with them and, and try to write credible women characters and all that other stuff that just trying to do your job as a writer to be able to write something other than yourself, you know. Right. But I, I, I liked Wanda and I liked Mockingbird. So I wanted to do nice things with them. What kind of illustrator was Richard Howell to to work with? I know that he was on the East Coast and you were on the West Coast, right? Right. And did that cause any issues trying to communicate or anything? Not really. Um, Richard and I were friends before we did any of this stuff, and I, you know, and I did know him and and Carol um, socially, and when I was on the East Coast, you know, whatever. He was not a demanding artist. You know, I would say, here's the story, and he would draw the story and make it better, but he wasn't trying to change it or, or kibitz or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, I worked with him later at Claypool, the company that he started, doing another thing that I really <laughs> that I really like. I put in a pitch, if you can ever find it, Phantom of Fear City from Claypool was a series that I was very happy with later and, and has rarely been seen because it was from Claypool but hmm. um yeah no Richard and I um got along fine we just you know we'd get on the phone and and but he left it to me to, to come up with the story so we didn't have to hash anything out or or anything like that okay and was that different from the way you worked with Al Milgram or was it similar well that was different because Milgram and I were definitely we wanted to co-plot it Okay, I'm thinking of two different things here now. I'm thinking of Captain Marvel, which is where we, we first worked. We wanted to co-plot Captain Marvel, and that became a problem because he was on the East Coast, and I was on the West Coast, and it was a bi-monthly book. So every two months, we'd get on the phone and have to sort of, like, crank it up from zero and you know to get there. And Al did have ideas about things that he wanted to do, so we'd have to, you know, we'd have to sort of work all that out on the fly. And it became sort of there were you know it's not friction there we weren't mad at each other or anything but it was just sort of hard to get all those elements together on a phone call every 60 days so when the west coast avengers came around we kind of decided 
that I would do the story and he would do the art and that would be, I mean, you know, he still would throw me ideas, but it was, it wasn't like on the phone, figure it out while we're sitting here. He might say, when you do that next issue, I'd like to do this in there somewhere. And I'd have time to kind of work that into my, to my thinking. Okay. So no, uh, West coast Avengers was done in the sort of the traditional, you know, the writer comes up with the story, the artist draws the story kind of thing. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, one more question about Vision Witch, and we'll and then I'll move back over to West Coast Avengers here. The um, the story with Crystal and Quicksilver that you inserted here was a yeah. That's a that's quite a dramatic turn of events for them that had very long lasting effects. They, and I found it, I was surprised to read it in that story with Vision and Scarlet Witch, but I guess you didn't have a chance elsewhere to use those characters. But what? Why did you decide to insert that story into the that miniseries? Well, I liked Crystal again, not as much as I liked the other women, but I mean, I I, <laughs> I liked Crystal, and yeah. I did not like I did not like Quicksilver. I always Quicksilver was always an asshole. So I thought, well, he's always been completely unbending and and basically a bigot, a racist, and you know whatever you would call it in terms of mutants. And again, you know, I was doing and throwing in, you know, guest stars and holidays and all that stuff. But still, that could become sort of a one note kind of deal. So I uh, wanted to flesh it out, and you know, it just sort of went that way. That I thought this guy's an asshole, she's a nice person. But she's married to an asshole. Yeah, you know there was an element of soap opera, obviously, in totally. this thing too. If you're, you know, if you're going to write about a pregnancy, you're probably moving more towards soap opera than you are intergalactic space combat. So, all that stuff just kind of fit together, and that was I did it, and nobody really, I mean, and nobody said don't do it. But afterwards, people said don't really pursue it. And I did sort of pursue it, and that led to some some head banging on down the line. And you know, at the end of the West Coast Avengers, uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of head banging at the yeah. end of the West Coast Avengers. And 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 part of it was over. Yeah, you know, I was still doing Quicksilver as an asshole, and and that wasn't the main reason, but that was part of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, you carried that storyline over to. Um... Fantastic Four as well, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and speaking of Fantastic Four, you, you put Thing into West Coast Avengers for a little while. He was kind of fresh off of his own title. Um, was, again, was that something that was like, we need a place for Thing to go? Can you take him, Steve? Or was that kind of your idea as well? No, that was editorial, actually. Um, the Thing had quit the Fantastic Four at that point in, in Fantastic Four continuity. Yeah. And so when I got the West Coast Avengers, Mark Grunwald said, we want the thing in here for a year. He's going to be he's going to be yours for a year. Oh, wow. So he was there for a year and then he went back to the Fantastic Four. Wow. So yeah, that's interesting how things work behind the scenes like that. They have all of these characters, they're, you know, uh trading them around like a like sports figures or something <laughs> sports teams. Well, it, it, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're if you're writing any Avengers, then Kang is like your villain. And if somebody else wants to use Kang, I mean, the way we did it in those days was you talk to the writer. You'd go to, you know, you'd go to the guy and you'd say, I got a real good idea and I need to use your villain. Is that OK? And and you'd always say yes. You might sometimes say, well, I need to do this thing in order to get there. Or, but, you know, but I will. I mean, it was, it was all very collegial. Every writer of a book was sort of in charge of all the characters that were associated with that book. If you wanted to use Doctor Doom, you had to go and talk to the Fantastic Four writer, right? Yeah. I guess the difference between the 70s and the 80s was in the 70s, it was pretty much individual fiefdoms. I mean, you know, once I was given Captain America, then Captain America was mine and I could do whatever I wanted to do with Captain America. Um, in the 80s, there was a little bit more of editorial saying, you know, we want to get this to happen, so do this. But again, it was like, you, you know, you've got the thing for a year. Now do some, do what you want to do with him. Yeah. So it was a slight difference, but that was a difference, I guess. Is that the same situation that happened with Moon Knight a, few, a little while later? Did they come to you and say, hey, here's another character for you? No, that was me. That was, you know... Part of the Avengers is rebooting the the group every once in a while. Yeah. And um, if it weren't the 80s, I probably would have dropped like Wonder Man, who never woke up for me. I never got really much out of Wonder Man. 
you know, I might have dropped him and replaced him. As it was, I was just sort of like adding new people and, and, and shuffling things around. But no, Moon Knight was unused and uh, a good character and I thought would make an interesting addition to the team. There's a couple of other characters that you created for for your time on West Coast Avengers are uh, Master Pandemonium and Firebird. Yes. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about your inspiration for those characters. Master Pandemonium was inspired by Doctor Doom. I wanted a Doctor Doom-like character and you know doctor master the you know the name <laughs> yeah. kind of went but i was but i was think i had read something about pandemonium which means lots of demons all demons and you know i had this idea that this guy was sort of made up of demons and i thought that that would give him an ambiance kind of like doctor doom i mean you know you can't ever replicate anything directly but i thought it would put him in the same ballpark yeah. As far as Firebird goes, that's something I sort of look back on with a with a skeptical eye. Um, <laughs> conservatives were starting to say, well, how come nobody ever pays any attention to our ideas? I think today we can understand why nobody pays any attention to their ideas. But at the time, it seemed like, oh, yeah, I guess we're not treating them fairly. So I got a letter from somebody who said, you know, I'm a I'm a Christian and there's never any Christians in comics that are, you know, that aren't evil behind the scenes or something. And I thought, yeah, that's right. You know, I claim that I can sort of write anybody. I should come up with a credible Christian character. And so I did. I have no problem with Firebird as a character. I fault myself for sort of falling <laughs> for the, oh, nobody treats us fairly concept. <laughs> but she was all right. The interesting thing was, um, you know, she was supposed to be really a serious Catholic. And Al Milgram is Jewish, you know, and, and quite happy to be so. Yeah. So I don't think he ever quite understood, no more than I did, because I'm not Catholic either. But I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know that we totally understood so she she tended to wear robes a lot, and when she first showed up, she was wearing those white robes and so forth. Right. But she was a work in progress. But I mean, you know, I I feel like I did justice to her. I feel like if that's the character that that I'm creating here, I feel like I gave her a good storyline. And in fact, I'm you know I'm quite happy with the whole Lost in Space Time uh, sequence. Yeah. In which she was a major player. But I, you know, the the origin, the the behind the scenes origin story of Firebird makes me sort of grit my teeth now. <laughs> well, it, it was surprising reading this material and how just how outspoken of a Christian character she is, because that's something that yeah, you you just don't see usually. Well, I, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to do a legitimate. I mean, you know, she was she was more Christian than a lot of Christians in that way. But I yeah. mean, in, for who she was supposed to be, I wanted to do her right. Wanted to give this, I think it was a, a woman or, you know, who wrote to, wrote the letter, wanted to, you know, do a credible Christian character. Mm -hmm. was, wasn't evil behind the scenes. Now, she also plays a big role in the story with Hank and his suicide. And I'd love to hear right. um, some, some of that and tying those two characters together. Well, as I, you know, I've said for years, I mean, and people have been astonished be, and then they point out this story, but... Hank Pym never really, like, he was a character who didn't work. I mean, Hank Pym, the character, kind of was Iron Man and kind of was Giant Man and kind of was Yellow Jacket. And by the time West Coast came around, this was another Mark Grunewald thing. Mark Grunewald said he should be Professor Pym, Dr. Pym. He should be Dr. Pym. And this was based definitely on Doctor Who. I mean, you know, he wanted a, he wanted a Doctor Who-like character. <laughs> So, okay, so now he's not even a costume superhero. He's he's this guy. And as a fan, as a reader, he I just never really got too interested in him. He was, for one thing, he changed characters all the time. For another thing, he whined about it. I mean, he was always like, oh, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I, I, I'm, I've got all these problems. So as a character, he didn't, he didn't, do much for me but mark said let's make him dr pym and i you know i looked at it and i thought well this is really a come down for him i mean he started out 
he started out as a scientist, yes, but then he became a superhero, and then he became an Avenger, and then then he failed. You know, it's like all these things went wrong, and it just, I said, well, then what if he committed suicide? What if he just said, you know, this has never worked out, I'm done with it. And this was all part of, you know, in my brain at the same time, I was thinking of this Christian character, and I thought, well, so she's not going to want him to commit suicide. It's a mortal sin. So those two things came together, and, and so there we were. That was the story. Wow. And I would imagine that, you know, dealing with a topic like suicide is something you need to flag th- by editorial before going forward, right? Well, he didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's true. But even just the, the you're still writing for a demographic that's younger. And like, I don't know if this is too heavy of a topic for, for that age group or what. Like, is that a consideration? It's a consideration, but I didn't feel that the way that the story unfolded, that it was a problem. I mean, I yeah. could the idea that he's going, things are terrible, things are terrible, things are terrible, I'm going to kill myself. But then he's saved from doing that pretty much indicates that that's not what you're supposed to do. Right. I mean, I guess at the end of at the end of the Secret Empire and Captain America, Richard Nixon kills himself. Um, (laughs) But that was off panel and that was not really Nixon and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we, you know, it was off panel and it was merely a springboard for Captain America to go on to other things. So. No, I don't. I mean, Mark and I, Mark Grunewald was a was a more hands on editor than Roy Thomas had been, shall we say? Yeah, he wasn't telling me what to do all the time, uh, you know, or very often. But he would say, you know, I want Doctor Pym in this book, and I, you know, and I would have to do that because that was my job. So I would assume, and I really don't remember, but I would assume that yes, I probably told Mark what I was going to do. But he didn't say no or change it or do anything about it. I mean, I don't recall any editorial interference in that thing. I mean, I'm just I'm telling you, Hank Pym didn't do much for me as a character, but he was in my book now. So I wanted to give him a story. I wanted to give him screen time. I wanted him to do stuff. And I couldn't, you know, I mean, this is all sort of filling in blanks much later. I don't know that I thought about all this in this much detail at the time, but I mean, Having him get a new identity as a superhero, I mean, first of all, Mark wanted him to be Doctor Who rather than a superhero. And so, like, he wasn't going to turn into Centipede Man, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't going to put on a costume and do anything. And so what was he going to do? And so the idea of do- doing it from a personal standpoint made a lot more sense. And so, all you know, all that stuff just comes together while you're, you know, sitting there thinking, well, what would be the thing to do here? And, I mean, that's about all I can say about it. I just, uh, I wanted to give him a a real storyline, something that really made something out of his character. And if that meant blowing his brains out, (laughs) (laughs) but not, you know, then that's where we went. Yeah, and it's great because there is definitely the distinct. This is the Hank before, and this is the Hank after. Like he, it, it renewed his his lease on life, and uh, yeah, and you really, ch- you did change just the way he spoke and his the and and um Al in the the acting the, that he drew. Um, Hank really changed at that point, and that was a. I think it, it was good because, yeah, like you said, he was always kind of whining about it <laughs> for the longest time. Yeah, and I mean, so that's what I just told you is the way I looked at it. And so in the years since, people come up and, and, and they say that was, you know, people would say, well, that was a really good Hank Pym story. And it's like, yeah, and it was because I didn't like him, you know, and they're like, what? You didn't like him, but you, you know, you did all this stuff. So, you know, I mean, I'm a person, I have my likes and dislikes, but I'm also a writer and I'm supposed to do right by the characters that I'm writing. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, toward the end of your uh, your time on West Coast Avengers, you uh, kind of sent a lot of the, the team members out, Mockingbird, Moon Knight, and Tigra, yeah. to leave. Did you know that you were leaving the book at that point? It's hard to say what point we're talking about. I mean, they made it clear that they were that they were going to like get rid of me. Yeah. But at what point they were going to do that, I'm not sure where that came in. My idea there was I was going to do Civil War before there was Civil War. I right. mean, the Civil War thing was basically the the idea reused later. But I had, you know, characters write themselves and 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 Mockingbird 
had been a shield agent. She had not come up through the Avengers ranks. She was a shield agent and, and Phantom Rider had drugged her and raped her. Uh, I mean, that was clear in my mind and I, you know, and I made it as clear as I could in the comic under the, you know, under the rules of the game. And I did not see Mockingbird saying, oh, well, (laughs) you know, life goes on. So I, you know, my favorite issue in the whole series is the one where she drops him off a cliff. You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> screw you, buddy. You, you know, I'm I'm not giving you any consideration. But that isn't the Avengers' way, and so that led into the story about you know where her husband doesn't think that this was the right thing to do, and then she's like, well, then, you know, what do you mean? And so that was the that was the characters writing themselves that she started to diverge, and and Hawkeye as loose as he was, he believed in the Avengers, you know, the way, the way the Avengers were supposed to be. And so they were splitting into two teams and that's what I was going to do. And it was eventually going to impact the East coast Avengers too. I was going to split all the Avengers into these two new teams. The people who thought it was, it was, you, you know, you had like the idealists. And and, yeah. Yeah. The idealists. I mean, you know, that's that's a little naive sounding for Avengers, but I mean, the, <laughs> yeah. you know, but I mean, yeah, exactly that. The people who believed in truth, justice, and the and the Avengers way, and people who said some of these, you know, a guy who drugs and rapes people doesn't deserve any consideration. So yes, I was building up to this whole thing where they were going to split into two different groups. And then the East Coast people would get caught up in this as they, you know, and, and I was, that's what I was going to do. But, wow. I would but love I get, to see that. Yeah. And it has more, I think, more weight than the eventual Civil War because you have a married couple at the at the head of the argument yeah. uh, in, the, in the opposing forces rather than just Tony and, and uh, Steve. Um, I think that's an, very, uh, it, it gives it a little bit more importance, a little bit more weight. Well, and Hawkeye and Mockingbird had always been sweeties. Yeah. I mean, they'd always been. It'd been a steady romance, know, steady relationship. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I was going to say Roger Stern set that up. It could have been Grunewald. I know Grunewald invented Mockingbird. And I think she first appeared in a Grunewald story before she was part of Rogers West Coast Avengers. Right. But it, yeah. you know, that, you're right. So, um, but that that you know that was her. She was you know she was in love with her husband, and he was in love with her, and that was all good right up until, you know, it turned out that she had a different point of view than he did, and 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 so yeah, you know, I mean it. it, it yeah, it it made it had a lot of imp, a lot of impact that they were yeah. married and that and that you knew that they liked each other and yet he couldn't go there and she couldn't go there and then you know so yeah man you deal with some pretty heavy uh, just situations through your your run it's uh, it's really neat to see because that's you know bringing the real life into the larger than life. And uh, that's, I think, what draws people back. That's Marvel, right? I mean, that's what Stan came up with, that, you know, Peter Parker actually lives in New York City and actually has a, goes to high school and actually rides. I mean, it was like, it wasn't always as heavy as suicide and rape, you know? But, yeah. I mean, it was like, you know, but it was it was supposed to be, that was always my argument with Captain America, that when Watergate happened, it's like Captain America is supposed to be living in our world, so how could he ignore that? You know, I mean, that was always there that that real life could intrude into the marvel universe Mm -hmm. so for your annuals you did these great crossovers i love the concept of the of the east coast and west coast getting together for a baseball match (laughs) the two teams Um, that that's so much fun and so what is it like working on that crossover with a different writer do you have to do a lot of uh, uh, planning that out together or is it like one person does part one and then hands it off to the next person it can go either way and I and I'm not sure that I remember exactly how it happened I mean what I talked before about I mean definitely we'd have to get together like you know DeFalco was writing it one year I guess and you know we'd have to get together either physically or on the phone and say well you know here's what I want to do and here's what you want to do and how will we make this work and that kind of thing. I would guess, I mean, each story was a standalone really. Now I'm, you know, there were a number of them and I'm kind of not remembering. <laughs> That's okay. Who did what, 
when Marv Wolfman and I did a Doctor Strange Dracula crossover, the only thing we agreed on was at the end of each issue, we would kill the other guy's character (laughs) (laughs) and then leave it for him to figure out what to do about it. Right. I mean, so that was the thing where that, I mean, that Dracula story, the only thing that had to happen was Dr. Strange died. And my Dr. Strange story, the only thing that had to happen was Dracula. As far as West coast and East coast Avengers, I, you know, I, I'm thinking back my stories. I don't think that I, you know, that it was so much a part two of anything as an individual story, but we definitely had to coordinate them, and yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. You know, I couldn't I couldn't very well kill people. I didn't kill anybody, but I mean, I couldn't very well do stuff and then just dump it in into Falco's lap or whatever. Yeah. You know. Well, and speaking of coordination, uh, the Lost in Space Time story is you must have. Uh, I don't know if you need to have one of those boards where you're tying strings onto thumbtacks and whatever to connect the plot points but that was a great story it was so convoluted and and uh, and wonderful can you tell me about writing that and piecing that together well when i did when i did a time travel story in avengers the kang ramatut death of swordsman thing in the actual avengers yeah back in the day i thought about doing that because kang was a time traveler and all that and people said to me, nobody has ever written a good time travel story. They always forget to tie up all the ends and there's always things, which to me was like, well, that's a challenge. Now let's see if I can do that. So I think that I dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's when I did the Kang story. Um, and so, you know, X years later, I'm sitting there thinking, well, what am I going to do now in the West Coast Avengers? And I thought let's do an even bigger time travel story. Let's, you know, let's, let's challenge myself even more. A lot of what I do is a challenge to myself. You know, I mean, it's like I say, well, that's, that has never been done or, you know, or it's never been done at this scope or whatever. And so that, that interests me. Can, can I pull that off? Can I make that happen? I did not have thumbtacks and strings on a board, But I definitely had, you know, 20 sheets of paper with markings on them and things that I could, you know, as I figured it out. But that, again, you know, when I when I first said, let's do that and make it big, I didn't say, oh, it'll run seven issues. (laughs) You know, it's (laughs) just like, well, I mean, but now, you know, so now this happens. So now we have to go back to yet another segment in order to do the things. And how is that all? And, you know, and it, and it, and we had just introduced Firebird, and so Firebird and her Bible and all that stuff, that all worked in there. Um, yep. And then, and you know, doing continuity, we go back and we find Doctor Strange and the Fantastic Four and all this kind of stuff. You could not do that. You could not do that story today. Uh, it's, it's you know, way too tied into continuity. Right. But no, that was that was fun for me. How many times could I split things up? And then, so... Mockingbird ends up in the Old West and things happen. I mean, none of that stuff going in, it wasn't like I said, oh, yeah, I'll I'll put her in the past and let her get drugged and raped. But that's what happened. And so that became something you got to tie that in, too. You got to make that work. You got to do all that stuff, which to me was the fun of the writing. You know, I mean, that's that's I like many things about writing. I like doing characters, but I, you know, but I like also pulling it all together, making it all, you know, making it all come out and, and actually be a story and not just some half-assed idea, you know. So so what you're saying is you had the concept, but you didn't have the conclusion. So you kind of dug yourself a big hole and then had to later on had to figure out how you're going to get out of it. I, I do a thing that I call throwing plates in the air, which is like I would be writing any story And I'd go, well, this would be like really cool if this happened. And I don't really know where that's going to go, but it's cool. So let's throw (laughs) that plate up in the air. Right. Right. And and I know the plate's going to come down and I'm going to have to catch it. But I sort of I guess I have faith in myself that I can catch it, even though I don't know what's going to happen. So but when you're doing a a story like that, I start out and I don't really know where it's going to go. I mean, it's just like, let's let these characters, let's throw these characters into the situation and see what they do. And then (laughs) that will, you know, that will help. But as each issue goes along, you get a better sense of like, well, okay, I've I've got a structure thus far and I know that it can't go on forever. So how am I going to like pull that back together? And so, you know, by the time I get to the end, I know, you know, I know what I'm doing. It's it's a it's a process, right? I mean, it's like 
I threw up a I threw a plate up in in issue number one, and now it's issue number four, and here comes that plate. So that's got to fit into this thing too, you know. And as I say, it's sort of I guess degree of difficulty in a sense. You know, the harder it is, the more fun it is in a sense if you can make it work. So totally. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, in that approach, it would work well. Normally, I can just imagine that it takes a lot more thinking and involved. It's just more involved with the lost in space time since you've got so many different plates that you're throwing up in the air yeah. during that story there. But that's, you know, that's part of the challenge, like you said. It's like you gave yourself a challenge and <laughs> you, yeah. you came out of that one well. That's for sure. Well, you know, I mean... And then and once you get done with that, then you go right back to writing one issue stories or, you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all part of the, it's all part of the process. It's all part of I mean, I see I was going to say it's all part of being a comic book writer, but but I'm not a comic book writer anymore. And, and the guys who are comic book writers these days are undoubtedly dealing with completely different setups and right. and and structures and so on and so forth. But for me, that was part of being a comic book writer of of having a good time and and so i found out what you know what gave me a good time was the challenges and the characters you know yeah. well what are you working on these days is there anything that you would like to share with the listeners well for years and years and years i mean after i after i got out of comics i went and wrote some novels and so forth and after i got on with that i was you know in in retirement age you know i mean i could yeah. i could i have grandkids i like to travel i like to do all this stuff and i would go to conventions and people would say what are you working on now and i'd go nothing and they'd go <laughs> what you know because you're supposed to be working on something all the time um and so yeah. i eventually um uh came up with a challenge you know i set myself i said what you know what would be like something i'd really find challenging to do right now um, I wanted to do a story that had lots of characters in it um, and and follow each of those characters, you know, not just like here's the here's the four, six, eight leads and then a bunch of background people. But like, no, everybody gets a story. Can I do <laughs> can I do a series in which everybody has a story? And I thought that would be fun to kind of try. And I would and I sort of took, you know, I did it for a while and then I'd go travel or, you know, or I'd. Or, you know, or I'd find something else to do. And so, but it became a great answer, you know, because people would say, what are you doing now? And I go, yeah, I'm working on this really big project, <laughs> which I kind of was, you know, but I didn't, um, it was just something to do when I wasn't doing something else. I mean, I, yeah. I wanted to do it, but I wanted to do these other things too. Then came this pandemic you might have heard about. Oh, yes. I think I recognize and, that. And I was, you know, and I was sitting home every day. And which isn't a whole lot different from like my normal life as, you know, as a writer, I would sit home every day. But when I was, you know, an active writer, if I decided that I wanted to go to the movies that afternoon, I could go to the movies. Or if I wanted to chill out and, you know, watch a bunch of TV or if I wanted to go, you know, visit friends or if I wanted to, do, you know, I could do it. No, I couldn't do that anymore. All I could do was sit home. Right. Yeah, right. So. That finally got me to, you know, to, to work on this project full time. And, and so now we are close to the end of it. I mean, I would say only a couple months away from having dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. So the next step is finding somebody who wants to draw a story that has a whole lot of characters <laughs> right, in it. Yeah. Right. I mean, George Perez is no longer doing his thing. So yeah. how many guys actually want to do that? So I've said all along, and it's still true, I may get to the end of this and be totally happy with what I did, and it may never appear on your local newsstand because it's just too too hard for somebody to draw, or, you know, despite the fact that I like it, maybe, you know, the publishers don't see anything. I mean, it's like, who knows, right? So... Um, I'm going to pursue it. I'm going to, when I get it done, I'm going to, you know, see if there's anybody out there who, who there may be a bunch of artists who are unemployed now who used to work for DC, you know, I mean, so right. there may be people out there who, who are interested in, in doing this kind of thing. I have no idea, but the, I mean, but the basic idea was, um, to set myself a challenge. Um, it is the most complex thing I've ever written. It certainly is. I mean, it, it, it you know, compared to 
lost in space time or whatever. I mean, uh, wow. it's much bigger than that. Yeah. Well, I hope we get to see it sometime. I mean, if, then. if nothing ever comes of it other than the fact that I had a good time, then I had a good time. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, th- thanks so much, Steve, for uh, sharing all of these stories and, uh, and getting lost in the past uh, with us today. It was a real treat. We thank you for uh, spending some time with us. Hey, you're welcome. Hey, you're welcome.